welcome to this uh, mid-month um, seminar. And uh, I'm Nick Cull. Um, we're uh, uh, co-hosting from the University of Southern California's Center on Communication, Leadership and Policy. I'm delighted to be able to host this uh, program today. Uh, I think that the um, audience that we have at these is a, um, a unique mix of people with policy and scholarly interest in um, the world of uh, public diplomacy. And that we, um, so it's, it's a, a pleasure to see you all uh, in, the, um, uh, uh, in the room. And uh, it's also a privilege to be able to bring together a uh, unique um, group of, um, of, 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 of scholars to talk about, uh, I think, a very important uh, subject. Now, the subject today will be some recent research that was done by the Oxford Internet Institute into the Chinese government's use of bots to amplify um, their digital diplomacy, the, the presence of Chinese diplomats on digital platforms. And uh, we'll be discussing that today. Uh, first of all, uh, two of the researchers are, are with us and I'll introduce uh, the researchers. Uh, we have uh, Marcel Schliebs, who is researcher at uh, Oxford's um, uh, Oxford's Internet Institute. He's a data scientist with the program on democracy and technology. His research is located at the intersection of political science, statistics, computer science, and it focuses on the effects of disinformation and micro-targeting on political attitudes and behavior. He's developed quantitative approaches for examining state-backed information operations and further studies the role of artificial intelligence for 21st century great power competition. He holds a BA degree uh, in political science from Zeppelin University, and that's a relatively new university uh, in Baden-Württemberg, Germany, uh, located uh, in a beautiful campus on Lake Constance. Uh, and he has an MSc in social data science from Oxford. In the past, he's worked as a junior US correspondent for uh, German public television. Uh, he's worked at the French National Election Study and served with the German Foreign Ministry and NATO's Arms Control and Weapons of Mass Destruction Non-Proliferation Center. Joining Marcel is Hannah Bailey, who's a doctoral candidate at the Oxford Internet Institute and a researcher at the Computational Propaganda Project. Her research focuses on China's use of state-sponsored digital information. In particular, she focuses on the effect of China's digital disinformation campaigns on international audiences by assessing how they interact with this disinformation. She employs both quantitative text analysis, social network analysis to explore, for example, how uh, bots are used and the ways that external audiences engage with these bots. She holds a BSc uh, from uh, LSE and two MSCs in Contemporary Chinese Studies and the Social Science of the Internet, which both are from Oxford. And she studied Mandarin at Fudan University. Her DPhil is funded by the Oxford Inter Internet Institute's Shirley Scholarship. Uh, and to discuss the uh, scene in uh, the context of uh, China's digital public diplomacy, and the significance of the report, we're very lucky to have with us a uh, distinguished sonologist, Orville Schell, who is the Arthuros Director of the Center on US-China Relations at the Asia Society. He's a former professor and dean at the University of California's Berkeley Graduate School of Journalism. Uh, he's originally from New York City, studied at Harvard and Berkeley, worked for the Ford Foundation in Indonesia, covered the war in Indochina as a journalist and has traveled widely in China uh, all the way back to the 1970s. He's the author of 16 books uh, and 12 of those were about China. Most recent books include uh, Mandate of Heaven, the Legacy of Tiananmen Square for the Next Generation of China's Leaders. 
He's also the recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship, Overseas Press Club Award, the Harvard Stanford Shorstein Prize in Asian Journalism, and he is a fellow of the Weatherhead East Asian Institute at Columbia and a senior fellow at our own Annenberg School um, uh, Center on Communication, Leadership and Policy. He's also currently uh, co-chair of the task force on US-China policy. So I, I feel uh, that we have a dream team to uh, discuss this subject. And um, what I'd like to do now is uh, pass the, the, the conch over to Orville to provide some context. It's nice to be here with um, the USC um, Center and with the Oxford Internet Center. Uh, this is really an interesting and important topic. Uh, one I think that we could sum up in the very concise term, uh, techno autocracy. Um, and before we get into a description of just how uh, the Chinese Communist Party is using the internet to amplify uh, social media. I, I thought maybe I'd just take a few minutes and try to set the, the broad, broader context uh, uh, of why this is happening. Why is this so important to China? And what is the larger configuration of which it is a part? So the first thing I think that's important to, to recognize is that what is going on in social media is sort of the latest evolution of a very long historical effort that the party has made. Uh, and it can be sort of loosely described as the united front effort, which means that it wants to project outward uh, the message of the party, whatever it happens to be at that moment. The good news of the Chinese Communist Revolution under Mao, and now the good news of China's rejuvenation under uh, uh, Xi Jinping. And within this configuration, there's an enormous number of media outlets that are rather traditional, uh, like uh, they had Global Chinese Television International is now a new uh, unification of the various other television networks they used to have is all around the world in many languages. You all are familiar with things like the China Daily, uh, the Confucius Institutes, Confucius Classrooms, um, uh, forums that they have of international nature like the Boa Forum, uh, even Xinhua, the new China news agency. All of this uh, is sort of a more traditional part of China's effort to do what they now call uh, telling the Chinese story better. Now, why you might ask, is this so important? Uh, because in fact, the amount of resources that are put into it, the amount of manpower, the amount of organization is really quite staggering. Um, I think here, um, the importance of China being reflected well in the world uh, gets back to a, a very deep historical question that really in, in a certain way, the whole Chinese communist revolution and then it's sort of more mutant, uh, cryptic, uh, sort of Leninist capitalist uh, phase uh, more recently is all part of a very deep and abiding Chinese dream to restore China to a state of greatness. And you have to remember, historically speaking, the, it's the, the abyss into which China had fallen the end of the 19th century and throughout the first half of the 20th century. Uh, the old dynastic system collapsed, a new Republican system came uh, into being. But recall that Sun Yat-sen, whose name everybody knows, was only president for 45 days before that collapsed. And China fell into this uh, interregnum of real feudalism of warlordism where the country was divided up. Chiang Kai-shek came along, managed to reunify it, fight it briefly. And then what happened? The Japanese came in and they occupied most of the country. And during that period, uh, you will also recall that China was really looked down upon uh, by all of the so-called great powers as something of a basket case. You remember the, uh, the, 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 the rather demeaning description of China as the sick man of Asia. Um, and indeed, it did describe the rather hapless case that didn't seem like it would ever 
uh, manage to gather itself up together again and restore itself to anything that was close to the semblance of the, the greatness that most Chinese imagined it once was during the dynastic period when it was the most powerful uh, national entity in, in, in the world as far as it knew, which was of course Asia at the time. So there's this deep and abiding yearning, I think, uh, for China. Uh, and this is, I say, one of the great sort of psychological wellsprings of energy that have animated all of the various aspects and different uh, chapters of the Chinese Communist Revolution right up to today and, and Xi Jinping's China dream. And that is to see China uh, be wealthy, powerful, influential, and able to hold its own in the world, even to, I think, uh, in, a, in a rather unanalyzed and sometimes very destructive way, to be able to throw its weight around, just as it imagined and it experienced the great powers did back when it was in a hapless supine state and unable to, uh, and able to retaliate, unable to defend itself. And so what we're gonna hear today is a rather supreme and almost uh, uh, absurdly tenacious effort uh, by the party to uh, create a, a, a simulacrum of a success story as if China didn't have enough success to go uh, to be convincing on its own. It, it wants to, to adopt all of the techniques of a Leninist propaganda system which are deeply still rooted in China and amplify and project the success story of China out around the world. But that also involves, of course, defoliating and amputating anything that might uh, make China appear negative. Uh, and even if uh, it, 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 some of the utterances that its leaders make, its ambassadors in this case, uh, its diplomats, even if that is insufficient, well, then the propaganda organs of the United Front, all of the things that I've just mentioned, will step into the breach and they'll help amplify it. So I think this is a, a very deep-seated yearning uh, for China to be esteemed and be respected. Now, the final thing I will say is that I think one of the, 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 the aspects of China that we see enabling it to gang up, for instance, with Russia, against uh, the sort of liberal democratic countries of the world is this idea that, that both China and Russia have cultures of aggrievement. They both feel disesteemed. They both feel aggrieved. They both feel disrespected. And you constantly hear the trope in China amongst Chinese diplomats of you know, mutual respect. And of course, the repose to that is, well, you act respectably and you gain respect. But in the Leninist sort of propaganda uh, uh, scheme of things, uh, respect can also be manipulated. It can be managed, it can be forced, and it can be contrived. Uh, you can, uh, and that is what I think we see going on. And that's what I think our colleagues from Oxford will help us understand the dimensions of this effort which are Herculean in scope. And they, 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 they brook no, no gap. There's, they, they, there's no effort that is, 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 too, uh, is too much, is too extreme. And I think this does bespeak of this very deep and one should not trifle with it because it is, it is a kind of a psychological wellspring of energy and dynamism and commitment that wants China to appear, even though it doesn't always act in such a manner in a way that uh, uh, would, is worthy of esteem. So maybe I'll stop here and let's, uh, let's hear from our colleagues at, at the Oxford Internet Center. I would just like to note that China, or as we refer to, may refer to here as the People's Republic of China's uh, influence operations, um, can take many forms. These can include state media articles, distorting facts about human rights violations in Xinjiang, 
or accusing various other Western media organizations of lying. Uh, but in our presentation today, we're going to focus on one specific form of information operation, um, also targeted at um, here in the UK, but we also look at the global operations. Uh, and that is the, the Chinese diplomats presence on Western social media and possible inauthentic amplification of the content that they post. Uh, next slide, please, Marcel. So, um, and again, next slide. Yeah, so just some useful definitions before we um, get into the meat of the um, research. Um, so hopefully everyone can hear me okay. I just see um, someone's posted that they have a problem with sound quality, but hopefully that's okay. So um, public diplomacy. Now public diplomacy, as you may all be aware, um, differs from traditional diplomacy, where the communication and interaction occurs between diplomats or rather representatives of nation states. Uh, but here we take diplomacy to be um, an instance where a government relies on external communication to influence a foreign government by influencing its citizens. And we look at public diplomacy in an online context. Now, in particular, we look at engagement. And here, engagement refers to the actions taken by social media users in response to the content shared by other users. So on Twitter, people may retweet or favorite a tweet or comment, and the same on Facebook. Uh, you can respond various emojis, etc. Now, engagement is relevant to online public diplomacy campaigns for two reasons. So first, by engaging with public diplomacy content, audiences can expand the reach of that content by uh, sharing it with their social network. So second, we can also use engagement as a metric to measure the success of a public diplomacy campaign. So it, engagement is both a public diplomacy tool and a measure of its success in reaching the audiences that it's targeting. Now, we adopt Twitter's definition of inauthentic engagement as any activity that attempts to make accounts or particular content appear more popular than it actually is. And this can include the use of multiple accounts to uh, inflate the prominence of a particular account or tweet, or the use of one account to, say, repeatedly engage with a, another user to artificially inflate uh, that particular tweet or content. And finally, we use the term super spreaders to refer to small numbers of accounts that drive high proportions of engagement with their particular users. And these accounts are being used to inauthentically amplify the content produced by that user. Uh, next slide, please, Marcel. So China's public diplomacy. Now I'll, I'll briefly skim over some of the points here because uh, Orville gave a lovely overview of the historical context um, of this research. But um, China's stance towards uh, diplomacy has really shifted from the Deng era where the discussion was um, centered around learning to live with the hegemon, with the US. Um, and under Hu Jintao, we had a more peaceful rise to world power approach, uh, with China keen to present itself as being more cooperative and a non-threatening rising power. And now we see a more aggressive strategy under Xi Jinping, with the public diplomacy aimed to tell China's story well, as Orville mentioned, um, and the underlying motives to build a new model of, model of power relations uh, with mutual respect at its core. Now, what are the tools that China uses? So China uses a variety of public diplomacy tools um, from the mobilization of its diaspora through the United Front, again, as, as Orwell mentioned, to uh, cultural exchanges. Um, but here we focus on international broadcasting as a means to influence international audiences. So the international broadcasting tools used by the Chinese Communist Party um, are multifaceted. They've included social media bots, state backed media outlets, among other strategies. Um, but there's been a real shift under Xi Jinping. So not only do we see more diplomats using social media, but we also see them using to propagate um, aggressive criticism of Western democratic institutions. And this is commonly referred to as wolf warrior diplomacy, where social media is being used by Chinese diplomats to engage with global populations in an increasingly aggressive and proactive manner. So China's public diplomacy strategy is constantly shifting, but in our research, we aim to uncover whether China's public diplomacy campaign receives genuine audience interaction, or if it's being artificially inflated 
by inauthentic engagement. And if we see this artificial inflation, this indicates that Chinese diplomats may be attempting to make their campaign look more uh, successful than it actually is. Um, and it might, they might also be trying to manipulate social media algorithms through this artificial amplification to reach more audiences. Uh, next, please, next slide, please. So as I alluded to in the previous slide, China is escalating its public diplomacy efforts to reach um, more audiences through the creation of its state-backed media outlets. And you can see this uh, in the blue line in the chart. And these have steadily increased since in number since 2009. Um, but what we have seen in recent years is a, is a sharp uptick in the number of Chinese diplomat uh, accounts on Twitter, which has coincided with the emergence of these Wolforia diplomats. So you can see this in the sharp um, uptick in the red line on the graph. Next slide, please, Marcel. Um, now, China's push to shape public opinion abroad has become a global effort. And you can see on this graph that um, we have Chinese diplomats stationed in at least 126 countries, and those countries are in red, with active Twitter or Facebook accounts. Uh, now we're going to take a more granular look at what these diplomats are actually doing on social media. Uh, if we go to the next slide. If we could go to the next slide, please. So this graph provides an overview of diplomat and state controlled media as uh, social media activity of oh, previous slide, please, um, on Facebook and Twitter. Um, if we could go back to the previous slide. Um, and in this graphic, uh, in the previous the graphic on the previous slide, um, one icon represented 1,000 posts or tweets. Uh, yes, yeah, so what we can see in this graph is that diplomats posted 34,000 times on Facebook during the nine month window of obs observation. And we have 189 uh, diplomatic Twitter accounts uh, retweeting a total of 200,000 times. And there's a real pattern here. So we see diplomats retweeting state media accounts. So diplomats are effectively acting as a vector to amplify state media content towards international audiences. Uh, next slide, please. So we should now ask what social media companies are doing about this. If we uh, go to the next slide, please, Marcel. Um, so in 2020, some of you may have seen Twitter and Facebook both introduced official account labeling. And we, you can see this in the, in the red um, squares here. So they highlight accounts that belong to foreign governments and state media controlled entities. And this ideally would help audiences be more aware when they're consuming content by uh, Chinese diplomats. Um, next slide, please. So we ask in our report how effectively these labels are applied. And we record whether accounts on Facebook and Twitter were actually assigned a Chinese government uh, official state entity label. Now, this table shows the share of Chinese diplomat and state media accounts that have been, had been assigned a label on the 5th of May. And surprisingly, we found that of the 189 Chinese diplomat uh, accounts on Twitter, only 14% were labeled. And the vast majority of Chinese diplomat accounts were unlabeled, uh, including many blue checkmark verified accounts. And on Facebook, only 66% of Chinese English state back media outlets were labeled and 22% of Chinese state media accounts are published in other languages. Now on the next slide, uh, please Marcel, uh, in response to our report, uh, we were happy to see that Facebook uh, labeled more state media, um, PRC state media accounts. Um, Marcel, if you go to the next slide. And we saw yeah, an increase from 66% to 82% for English uh, language uh, Chinese state media publications, and an increase from 22% to 96% in, in languages that publish in, uh, in, in outlets that publish in other language, languages. So that was an increase. Um, next slide, please. Now we know that Chinese diplomats are very active on Twitter, and we know that the account labeling may or may not identify them. But are these Chinese diplomat accounts also inauthentically amplifying their content to reach audiences? So this plot shows diplomatic retweeters. Now the percentage of user activity is plotted on the x-axis and the percentage of retweets on the y-axis. And the top 0.1% of the most active super spreaders accounted for over 
of all retweets and the most active 1% of users accounted for over half of the retweets that diplomats received. So this is a really strong indicator that we have a small number of inauthentic super spreader accounts that are amplifying Chinese diplomats. Um, next slide. Now, um, if we get to the next, yep. Yeah. Um, of all the users that um, retweeted Chinese diplomats, we have a high number um, that were later suspended by Twitter for inauthentic uh, engagement. And this graph shows a closer look at these suspended accounts. In red, we see Twitter accounts that retweeted Chinese diplomats that were later suspended by Twitter for inauthentic activity. And you can see these accounts clustered around diplomats that they're retweeting, and these diplomats are marked in blue. And many diplomats have a dedicated mushroom cloud surrounding them. Uh, that, so these mushroom clouds are exclusively amplifying that diplomat. And in this figure, we can see cones surrounding major figures, such as the Ministry of Foreign Affairs spokesperson. And these amplification cones are supplemented then by a large number of multi-use accounts that are concentrated in the center of the graph. And these accounts act as super spreaders. So they're retweeting hundreds of different uh, diplomats on a daily basis. Now, just to wrap up, uh, next slide, please. Um, PRC diplomats, Chinese diplomats, are increasingly active on social media, and they're part of a larger campaign to influence international audiences. Um, but then in turn, we see this inconsistent, inconsistent labeling by social media companies. So audiences may be unaware that the content they're consuming is actually authored by Chinese state officials. And we lastly, we see an amplification by super spreader accounts with the aim of reaching larger, larger audiences on these platforms. Uh, now I'm going to hand over to Marcel to talk in a bit more depth about some of the case studies here. All right, thank you very much. Um, and um, after this sort of at the macro level, um, if I show you what this looks like on the ground at the micro level and examples of diplomats. Um, action is laggy sometimes a little bit, um, but I'll, I'll try my best here. So one particular case study I'm going to look at exemplarily is the United Kingdom. But this doesn't mean that this is only going on there. In total, in our study, we found over 20, uh, 28,000 accounts, which at various stages um, amplified Chinese diplomats and state media and were later suspended. But today, we're going to look at a smaller example of the United Kingdom. The former ambassador at the time of our study, Liu Xiaoming, um, very prominent on Twitter with over 100,000 followers, um, has now uh, moved on to become the PRC's, I think, special representative for Korean affairs um, in sort of a part-time role after retirement, I believe. Um, but he and the embassy accounts were highly active, tweeting over 3,000 times, getting uh, hundreds of thousands of likes and about 50,000 retweets and replies each um, over our period of observation last year and early this year. Um, we found, um, among other networks, one specifically uh, coordinated example of, a, of an amplification network with 62 accounts that I'm going to look at in some more depth now. Um, about half of them Twitter suspended while we were studying them, and the other about half, uh, about 30 accounts were suspended then later after we alerted uh, Twitter shortly before publishing. Um, approach um, that contrary to account in isolation, but instead um, goes and look at the whole network and patterns of coordination between the accounts. Now, what I mean by that is um, we were looking at accounts, time patterns, retweet and reply networks, language, grammar, typos, follow networks, language patterns, and, and, and much more, and compared the whole universe of people or accounts engaging with the diplomats um, to sort of a reference group of all other users uh, engaging with the Chinese diplomats. And once we found sort of these electronic digital traces um, that the accounts left to be so distinctive from all other people engaging, we were confident enough to say there's a coordinated network. In the next few minutes before we go to the 
discussion to just show you some examples of these coordination patterns. One um, exemplarily is a bulk creation of accounts, very blunt sort of um, groups of four or five accounts being created sometimes within just seven minutes, um, only to go on and amplify uh, PSC diplomats hundreds or even thousands of times. Subsequently, um, before accounts, I think 16 in this uh, being, cre being created over multiple months, laying dormant and sort of waking up all at the same time on August 12th and 13th. Um, immigration to the UK and, and other controversies, groups of 15 accounts waking up all at the same time, again, subsequently amplifying PSC diplomats hundreds and thousands of times. more at the micro level, we see signs that some accounts are very likely operated by the same human operator, just switching very fast. If we look, for example, at the top middle panel here, um, we see that on September 1st at 7.22 p.m., the account Xiaojing 054 logs on um, at 9, uh, 7.22 p.m., retweets the ambassador to the UK five times in 13 seconds, then in the red panel takes 22 seconds, logs into the next account, uh, Caterpie something, eight retweets in 21 seconds, again takes 10 seconds, again a retweet chain and so on. And the same pattern happens in the exact same order on nearly every day in, in early September last year and also in, in August and October until the accounts are suspended. So clear signs of a micro operator operating multiple accounts, just retweeting the ambassadors a lot. Uh, we also looked at language use. Uh, um, um, innovative, I would say, we came up with the approach where we looked at all tweets made by the accounts in our network and comparing them again to all engagements, replies and so on to, to PSC diplomats, finding these blue cloud of very distinctive phrases that were only used by the accounts in the inauthentic network and by no one else, basically. Um, what sort of phrases of five or six words. Zooming in a little bit, we see that, for example, one distinctive phrase that was used by only accounts in our network and no one else was um, here the example of um, a friend in need is a friend indeed, or the Chinese Communist Party made a great contribution to the future of mankind and so on. Um, even more interestingly, if we look at some of these phrases, such as a friend in need is a friend indeed here, we see on the right that inauthentic accounts in the network use these phrases over multiple months um, in December, in October, in August. But not only did these accounts repeatedly use these distinctive phrases in replying to the ambassador, but also had the ambassador and diplomatic staff at the embassy themselves used these phrases um, even more months before that in March 2020. Now you can speculate, is it the same people operating both the ambassador account and the inauthentic networks? Are they just copy pasting from old ambassador tweets? Are they both copying their language from some sort of diplomatic uh, propaganda playbook? We don't know, but it's definitely something to watch. And last but not least, another um, trace or pattern we discovered was what I call mass verbatim quote reply tweeting, which means that accounts in the inauthentic network would both quote tweet the ambassador as well as reply to him very shortly after each other in within just seconds with the exact verbatim same text. So for example, here, the UK should be wise to treat China as a friend or the UK, uh, and China should join hands to fight the pandemic for a better global community of health and so on. This also happened in mass. Example here of um, the ambassador uh, tweeting something about an interview he gave about UK-China relations. And then uh, within just minutes of each other, 15 accounts doing this quote reply tweeting um, saying, it's a very powerful and compelling interview, timely and comprehensively, deeply absorbing and edifying, uh, deeply informative and insightful. And so 
Um, we don't have much time to go into detail into, into the themes, and you can all imagine them already, calling the Home Secretary um, or accusing her of glorifying criminals from other countries when meeting with Hong Kong democracy activists, defending the PSC over Xinjiang, saying that's all not like people think, attacking the BBC, especially also around Xinjiang coverage, praising China, calling it a leading country in nearly everything, 5G industry, biotechnology, green development, whatever, you always find China is a leading country in X, Y, and promoting an improvement in UK-China relationship at the national and local or regional level, for example, asking or demanding more fruitful cooperation between Manchester and China in, in this case. Um, now, before close, of course, the important question is what, what is the impact of this? And we need to acknowledge um, that we need to further study how many genuine users these campaigns are actually using. And in part, we need the platforms as well to help us to provide this data. Um, the, the impact was quite high. So if you look at this last graph here, um, on the x-axis, you see the time, and on the y-axis, how many of the retweets uh, shared that the inauthentic account uh, in network account for by the ambassador. And in red are accounts retweeting the ambassador that were deleted by Twitter themselves, and then in blue, the ones we flagged to them and they suspended afterwards. And we see that after August of last year, in nearly every week, more than half, more than 50% of the retweets Liu Xiaoming got came from just this inauthentic networks of 62 accounts. And it sparked even to uh, nearly 75% of his total retweets that came just from the inauthentic network. So very high relative impact, uh, almost 20,000 retweets, but we need to go deeper and look at how many genuine people and there's also reasons to believe maybe not so many if all these ecosystem self-referential but to close up and go into q a um, we we see a coordinated and authentic amplification network uh nearly ten thousand accounts amplifying uh diplomats at the global scale and being suspended later by twitter for platform violations zooming in 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 a highly active fake account network systems up to 75 percent of weekly engagement um, by uh, with this ambassadorial account and in the future um, just to provide an outlook i think we need to look more at additional um, geographies um, we see initial signs that this similar behavior is going on in other large european countries i don't want to spoil too much yet while we're investigating but i think we both need to do a bit more from summer break as well as our philosophies trying to make um, available to others by providing the source code, providing for others in academia or government need to, to replicate it in other con contexts. And if you're someone wanting to do that, please get in touch. We'll get, get you all the code and description how to do it. And you can study, study other countries as well. But I've already spoken a lot and we'll try, uh, leave it for now and move on to uh, your questions and happy to answer them. Thank you very much. That's great. Thank you very much, uh, Marcel. Thank you, Hannah. Um, well, one question that um, I think immediately comes out of this is whether the inauthentic uh, amplifying is being used for other things. So, uh, for example, uh, does it retweet material relating to the successful Chinese cultural YouTubers um, who, who are out there? Or is it solely being used to uh, carry um, uh, material referencing the diplomatic, uh, diplomatic uh, Twitter users? Uh, I think, we, yeah, we see the sort of behavior going on in, in a range of contexts. Um, we focused on, on the diplomats here. Hannah and I have also looked at a little bit at YouTubers before. Some of the accounts also, I think, shared some of their content and amplified. Um, Pro-PSC or CCP narratives that these accounts 
and other people at ProPublica and New York Times have also recently looked at um, yeah. networks promoting Xinjiang disinformation using very similar behavior. So, uh, second uh, follow-up question: um, uh, Do you? see other countries doing this who else is using these kinds of uh these kinds of tactics who's in the club so we recently produced another report on a global a global inventory of um you know every country or a large a large number of countries i think it's 89 countries and the different kind of um, disinformation techniques that we see these countries using so some countries are also using these kinds of inauthentic amplification techniques um but it's interesting because we see some of them just focus on using these tools domestically some of them are just in, interested in solidifying domestic uh, legitimacy whereas others like china russia iran which tends to be the largest um producers of these kind of this kind of content focus more on international audiences or, or, or also focus on international audiences um so there 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 is a trend for you know the larger your um information operations uh, information operations are um the more likely you are to be um engaging in international um operations one of the the features of chinese public diplomacy is that it often seems to have a domestic component uh, and in fact Chinese public diplomacy theory uh, stresses uh, the importance of a uh, domestic audience and I wonder what kind of domestic angle can you see here it was always with the Confucius Institutes it was always very important that uh, there was an absolute high number of people learning Mandarin uh, this was uh, presented at home as an indicator of uh, respect for uh, Chinese culture and, and ideas uh, and was was linked to um, the uh, ability of the uh, of the Communist Party. It's like that old beer commercial that the only the uh, Chinese Communist Party it can refresh the parts other parties cannot reach. It can give you the respect that no other system could could give you internationally. So, but what's the domestic angle here? It's really interesting because if you look at the actual content. The language that these these accounts these diplomats these networks are using and um, for a public diplomacy campaign it's not really the kind of language that you would expect to be trying to win the hearts and minds of international audiences it really is appealing to this nationalist um domestic audience um so a lot of people theorize that actually it's not really trying to convince international audiences um to support the chinese communist Party party to align with their um, international agenda, but it's instead trying to um, entrench its legitimacy among domestic audiences and among the international diaspora. Um, because if, if the domestic audiences believe that um, international audiences um, support the CCP or are you know, receiving information that the CCP is a legitimate party, they're more likely to then support the, the Chinese Communist Party's legitimacy. And it's a feedback loop um, of legitimization. But I think Hannah is right that uh, this, of course, feeds into the whole sort of nationalist, populist uh, uh, wave of sentiment. But I think it, it um, one of the things that's most curious about China's Herculean effort to sort of present itself abroad is that it does so much to alienate other countries at the same time it's wasting so many resources and so many man hours in trying to convince people. Uh, and I think that does bespeak of a certain kind of a contradictory impulse within the nation state and within the, the, the leadership. But that would, should not uh, make us think that they don't care what we think about them. I think they really do. And what's so surprising is that given that fact, they still do so much. I mean, what, what countries in the world have ever succeeded in alienating Canada? Sweden, Norway, Australia. I mean, these are the classic fence-sitting countries, and yet China has completely uh, uh, pushed them over the edge into animosity. So Orville, while you're here, uh, Greta has asked the question, uh, and I think you'll want to lead off on it. How, how do you think China will take advantage of the current situation in Afghanistan, both within Afghanistan and then in presentation of the world to uh, other, other countries? 
they don't welcome the U.S. leaving such a vacuum uh, of sort of extremist Muslim, uh, uh, you know, uh, toxic dump of sentiment that could easily slosh over into Xinjiang, with which Afghanistan shares a small border. But you will note that Wang Yi, uh, the, the uh, 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 had met with the Taliban representative in the Great Hall of the People, creating one of the most unlikely photographs in history uh, of those two together. So I think what they'll try to do is just uh, keep the, the Taliban well supplied with Belt and Road projects and hope that that will keep them out of Xinjiang. Has anything shown up yet in, uh, in, in Twitter? Um, Maybe I can draw the comparison and, and refer to one other aspect, how they might uh, try to exploit it, which is to present the US as unreliable, as um, a declining power, as a, a, the democrat, de democratic um, governance system of the US in, in decline and, and dysfunctional, which they have done pretty much. Uh, in the lead up and especially after the US presidential elections in the state media accounts and diplomatic accounts by highlighting um, Trump protesters and, and the election fraud uh, and, and all the protests significantly and trying to create a narrative of, of the declining US democracy. And maybe we'll see also similar kind of presenting the US as unreliable uh, foreign partner to, to other countries, especially in, in non-Western countries, in Africa and Latin America, Middle East, et cetera. We've seen that in um, uh, Kremlin media uh, framing uh, you know, for a long time. The un unreliability has been a major, uh, major um, uh, theme. I think there's a China media article that may be of interest if you're looking at it to see how the, the Chinese state media, or China, China media project has recently come up with an article um, describing how the People's Daily, which is the kind of flagship uh, media outlet of the Chinese Communist Party, recently put out an article trying to whitewash the, the background of the Taliban. They, they, I think they claim the Taliban was a, a student refugee group initially, and this received a lot of backlash on Weibo, the domestic Chinese social media platform of um, users uh, calling out the People's Daily um, for this characterization. And then I think the People's Daily then pulled down the article. So it's important to note there is actually a back and forth between Chinese state media and its domestic audiences. It's not a one way propaganda system um, that, you know, the user, user perceptions of this um, propaganda does then feed back into the kind of propaganda that is produced. But yeah, this might shed some light on, on the way in which the Chinese state media might be trying to frame um, the Afghanistan issue. So this is a question from Jessica Ludwig. Uh, my comment has to do with whether public diplomacy is the best frame for understanding uh, CCP's goals. My colleague Christopher Walker and I have offered the concept of sharp power as an alternative uh, frame. So have you, uh, have you looked at uh, sharp, um, sharp power uh, as an alternative for highlighting the emphasis on censoring. Perhaps worth pointing out that uh, the, the Hoover Institution does have a whole program project on soft, on hard, sharp power. And sharp power really is soft power, which sort of propels itself and doesn't, uh, isn't dependent on government uh, uh, sort of delivery systems and, and uh, uh, it, it's a kind of weaponized, state weaponized form of soft power. Uh, and I think that's what we see in, 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 in China. Uh, from my point of view, uh, I think it's helpful to uh, bear both uh, sharp power and uh, a public diplomacy uh, frame, though the whole point of why the United States developed the terminology of public diplomacy was to uh, allow a, a critique of uh, totalitarian information operations in, in diplomatic space so that they could say those wicked communists do propaganda, the virtuous United States uh, does public diplomacy. Uh, and um, 
but I think since the original coining of the term public diplomacy, it has grown into, uh, it, it sort of acquired its own ethical uh, content uh, and, you know, um, uh, public diplom diplomats in the West emphasize uh, exchange, they emphasize a two-way uh, approach and especially an, a, 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 an ethic of uh, listening. So uh, Gordon uh, Dewigwood says, how does Chinese public diplomacy handle negative experiences in other countries? For example, explaining the poor quality of masks donated to Italy in the early stages of the pandemic. So the ignore it, sort of censorship by... But on the other hand, also distraction. Um, they they would probably instead uh, highlight the numerous other instances where they delivered stuff, regardless of whether it worked or not. We've seen it, especially early in the pandemic, um, a lot in um, in first Italy, then other European countries, Serbia, then later Africa, Latin America, etc. And um, secondly, we've also seen sort of this drowning of legitimate criticism by distraction in other contexts on last. Uh, June 4th, you know, again, thousands of fake accounts um, were rushing to the accounts of the UK embassy in Beijing or their, or their ambassadors um, and just drowning any legitimate criticism in real nonsense, uh, claims that the Queen had died, claims that the Queen had died of, of the AstraZeneca vaccine or of herd immunity and other, and other things. So. obviously, and uh, distracting at the same time, our uh, reactions we frequently see there. Um, and coming back to, I think the, the, the question was also on, on sharp power. Uh, and at least in my understanding of, of sharp power, it really is more of an attempt um, to undermine um, the political system of, of, of another country. It's very negative, it's very targeted. Um, and while we do see that in the case of China, it China's public diplomacy campaign also encompasses a broader variety of narratives. We see pro-China narratives that aren't necessarily intended to undermine um, you know, the, the, the country in which it, to which it's targeted towards, but just to promote China as being, you know, in, in the case of um, in the case of the early COVID um, pandemic, we saw China putting out a lot of narratives saying, look, we're sending aid here, we're sending aid there. And that's not so necessarily trying to undermine the country in question, uh, more so just to promote its own, um, its own status. So rather than kind of trying to tease out or, or separate these narratives, um, we kind of prefer to use the, the umbrella term of public diplomacy to study these narratives as a whole. Sherry Mueller wants to know if there's any evidence that students, Chinese students studying the, in the US are part of these networks. Well, this is a really uh, vexing and, and troublesome question because the answer is yes. Uh, and uh, there is a Chinese Students and Scholars Association that is coordinated by the consulates and the embassy. And this is, it, it is, has networks all over the world. And regularly, Chinese students will meet with consular officials. There's budgets to set up activities. And in some cases, uh, students are uh, actually deputized to report back uh, as to what goes on at a university. But I think more subtle, but equally pernicious is the way in which this kind of surveillance network that operates within a university that presumes sort of openness and, and free discussion does tend to inhibit other Chinese students from mm -hmm. saying anything in class, even going to activities or really having a full-blown sort of university experience for fear that they would be, uh, there's an expression Chinese to hui ba, to report back, that their activities would be reported back and might even in some cases harm their parents, their friends, their families, and certainly uh, uh, their own uh, careers in this world where the social credit system is now in development and everything everyone does gets put into this new electronic dossier, uh, which is, uh, uh, was already a quite, well, a quite well elaborated system for people in China before the electronic age. Jessica's question was whether you'd looked at um, uh, social media in Spanish. Uh, and other languages, Hannah Marcel, uh, is, is it, uh, are they also- A dedicated 
we haven't done a dedicated uh, study on on Spanish in this context. We did earlier during 2020 do a study of um, COVID narratives by Chinese state media in German, French, and Spanish as well, um, to sort of look at how they're portraying their COVID biographies. Um, but we're starting to look at some other European languages on the diplomatic side as well, middle and Eastern European countries as well. Well, I think that that's coming, we're coming to the end of our time. Um, what I'd like to do uh, first is to thank uh, you, Marcel, and, and Hannah, and to thank Orville for a wonderful uh, presentation and a discussion, which I think uh, alerts us to the importance of uh, this subject and to keep uh, tracking, to keep listening, and uh, to pay attention to what's going on uh, in, in an increasingly uh, contested uh, world of uh, public diplomacy. Okay, well, thank you very much for attending today uh, and for our speakers. Wonderful questions from the audience, and I hope uh, the rest of the day is good. <laughs>